This video is sponsored by Wondrium. Stay tuned to the end to find out more. 19 of the hottest years on record occurred in the last 20 years. Compared to global average temperatures from 1950 to 1980, the world today is about 0.85 degrees Celsius or 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit higher. And based on climate model projections, in another 40 years, these temperatures will increase by another 1.5 degrees Celsius or 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit. Now you might ask, how can one degree of warming matter so much? After all, when you crank up the temperature in your house by a degree, you might barely feel it. But think about the size of the entire Earth and imagine how much of an increase in energy retention this mere one degree means. It is literally an astronomical number. A one degree increase means that just the atmosphere contains about five times 10 to the 18 kilojoules more energy. But if you also include the fact that at least a couple of meters of the ocean probably reaches an equilibrium with the atmosphere, this energy retention number doubles. To give you an idea, this is more than all the energy contained in the entire world's known oil reserves. In very simple terms, this increase in energy retained on Earth has to go somewhere. And this is what causes the havoc. More water evaporates from the oceans, causing more severe rainfalls in certain parts of the world. It increases the energy contained in hurricanes, causing more damage to coastal areas. Sea levels rise because warmer water expands in volume and more polar ice melts. Very few people in the world think the climate is not changing at all, as illustrated on this chart. The cause of this change is where the controversy lies because Earth has gone through many temperature cycles in the past. Why should this be any different? So is this change natural? What exactly is causing it? Can we do anything about it? Or are we on an inexorable path to climate catastrophe? The answers might surprise you. That's coming up right now. In order to discuss climate, we should agree on what we mean by climate. Just because this winter was warmer than last winter doesn't mean the climate's getting warmer. The difference between talking about climate versus weather is in the duration of the changes. When we talk about a change in weather, it could be in minutes, hours, days, or even a few years. The short period weather doesn't tell us much about the general trends in climate on Earth. If we have more rain two days or even two years in a row, it doesn't mean the climate's changing. Climate is something measured over decades, usually more than 30 years. It describes a general trend over a long period of time in particular places. When I talk about an increase in global average temperatures, it's just that, an average. There are parts of the world that will warm less and some will warm a lot more, but some rare areas might also cool. Parts of Southern Africa, for example, are warming about two degrees Celsius, and the Arctic appears to be warming four degrees Celsius, while the southern tip of Greenland is actually cooling. Temperature trends across the globe are not uniform because of the diverse geography of the Earth. But when scientists calculate the overall average temperature and how it has changed over multiple years and decades, they conclude that the climate is indeed changing. A higher overall temperature results in more extreme weather. How does this happen? It can be understood based on a simple principle. When I say the extreme weather causes havoc, it means that it imparts energy or does work. In physics, we can write work simply as a change in kinetic energy. In other words, you need energy in order to do any kind of weather damage. So for example, for the wind to act on Earth and cause storms or tornadoes, it needs energy. Where does this energy come from? The short answer is the sun. Actually, almost all energy on Earth comes from the sun in one way or another. When the sun heats up Earth, the heating is unequal. Over land, the air is drier and heats up faster than over the sea. This is because the specific heat capacity of water is much higher than that of land, meaning that it takes more energy to heat the sea than the land and so it will generally remain cooler than land. This means that the air is much warmer over land than at sea. And as with hot air balloons, hot air rises up because it has a lower density than cold air. But as the air from land goes up to form clouds, colder air from the sea comes in to fill the gap and we get a breeze or wind. 
Because hot air has low density, we get a low pressure zone compared to the cool air over the sea, which has a higher pressure zone. Air flows from high pressure to low pressure, and this creates wind. And if the pressure difference is very high, it can be a very strong wind. To complete the cycle, the hot air that rises up in the atmosphere eventually gets pushed to the sea where it cools down again, and the cycle continues. With global warming, the sun heats up the earth more, causing a bigger pressure difference between the sea and the land. And thus, winds can be more severe, causing more extreme weather. We also get more extreme rainfall because the water cycle also depends on the sun. When the sun heats the sea, water evaporates to form clouds. Eventually, these clouds become bigger and the water precipitates and falls as rain or hail or snow. Global warming accelerates the cycle of evaporating more water, resulting in more rain in places where the rain falls. In places where much rain doesn't fall, but where temperatures are rising, droughts result. Because the little water that's present there evaporates and not much rain falls to compensate for it. This means that certain parts of the world can not only experience more rain, but also more snow, more hail, more drought, higher winds, and so on. So global warming is not just about hotter weather, but also more extreme weather. And that can be dangerous for us humans, let alone all the other species in nature. But what is to blame for all of this? I said earlier that the sun is the main driving force for the climate, as well as life on Earth. Without it, Earth would be very cold and lifeless. The sun's energy output goes through cycles, about once every decade. So could the higher temperatures today be due to the sun getting hotter? Fortunately, computer modeling technology is advanced enough today to answer this question. And the answer is almost certainly not, because the total irradiance varies by only about 0.15% over 11 years. This is not nearly enough to explain the increase in global temperatures. One fact to keep in mind is that the temperature on Earth has changed many times in Earth's history going back millions of years. Earth's rotation around the Sun slowly changes over tens of thousands of years, causing cycles of ice ages and warm periods. The last ice age ended about 11,000 years ago. But has Earth ever been this hot? The answer is yes. It's actually been much hotter. In fact, 56 million years ago, Earth warmed by 5 to 8 degrees Celsius. You could have had a tropical vacation in the North Pole because it was so warm and lush. At that time, Earth was in the midst of extreme warming called the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum, or PETM. Now, you might ask, what's so bad about warm weather? I enjoy warm weather. Well, the problem is that extreme warming cycles like the PETM was a complete disaster for life on Earth. Deep sea organisms went extinct, oceans acidified, much of the land mass either went underwater or was uninhabitable by our mammalian ancestors due to excessive heat or humidity. Why am I talking about an event that occurred tens of millions of years ago? How is it relevant? Well, scientists have determined that it is the most analogous event to what we are in the midst of experiencing today. It's being studied extensively to inform us what we might be facing in the near future. There are many similarities, but also differences to the current warming. The PETM was also initiated by huge increases in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Why does carbon dioxide cause warming, but not oxygen or nitrogen, which the Earth's atmosphere is mostly made of? Well, greenhouse gases, including carbon dioxide, water vapor, and methane, each have at least three atoms in their molecules. The atoms in these molecules are loosely held and can absorb more vibrational energy. They're efficient at absorbing light in the long wave range, which is also called heat, which bounces up from the Earth's surface. These greenhouse gases then re-emit this long wave radiation back towards Earth's surface, resulting in warming. Other non-greenhouse gases, like oxygen and nitrogen, don't absorb the long wave radiation and so the heat passes through them and into space instead of being reflected back to Earth. Now you might say, but there were no humans back then. Burning fossil fuels couldn't have caused this. How did so much CO2 get into the atmosphere? The answer is that it was probably caused by volcanic eruptions. Many series of eruptions over thousands of years are thought to have caused it. 
How do we know? The evidence for this can be found in the fossil record, as well as carbon-dated rocks that show a significant increase in carbon-13, which is the isotope of carbon most prevalent in volcanic eruptions. It's estimated that on average about a net 0.24 gigatons of carbon was emitted into the atmosphere during a 50,000-year period to cause this severe warming that is known as PETM. By contrast, humans today are emitting 10 gigatons, or about 50 times that amount of carbon, yearly into the atmosphere. In addition, the current one degree warming has occurred not over thousands of years, but in less than 100 years. So is there anything to support the claim that human carbon emissions are a direct cause of global warming? Couldn't it also be natural? Show me the data. The most compelling evidence is in the study of isotopes of carbon in the atmosphere. Fossil fuels come from old plants, which contain a higher ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-13 than the atmosphere does. As fossil fuels are burned, the percentage of C12 goes up. In other words, the ratio of C12 to C13 would be expected to go up. And that's precisely what we see in the data. Volcanic eruptions, on the other hand, increase carbon-13, or C13, in the atmosphere, not C12. In fact, volcanoes only emit about 1% as much CO2 as we do. So they're not to blame. The sun is not to blame either, because if the sun was the culprit, then it would heat both the upper and the lower atmosphere of Earth. But what we see is only warming in the lower atmosphere, where greenhouse gases accumulate. In addition, for the past 50 years, solar activity has been such that on its own, it would have lowered Earth's temperature. Earth's natural climate cycles is likely not to blame either, because based on ice core evidence, we know that during the end of the last ice age, Earth warmed at an average rate of about 0.06 degrees every 100 years. But what we are seeing today is at least 10 times that increase, or about 0.6 degrees per 100 years. When simulations are run using just natural causes of climate change, they predict no change in temperature or even a slight cooling in the 20th century. But this is not what's happening. When we add in the unnatural effects created by emissions from man-made sources, it more closely aligns with observed results. And if we plot it all together, combining the natural effects with the man-made effects, the simulation fits the measured data almost exactly. And it's not like scientists disagree on the fact that Earth's temperature is changing. The agreement can be seen here between several notable institutions, including NASA. In addition, 97% of the world's climate scientists agree that man is the cause of this change. Sure, you can find scientists in the minority, 3%, to make fancy YouTube videos trying to prove everyone else wrong. But when was the last time 97% of scientists agreed on anything? This consensus should not be dismissed. Carbon dioxide emissions are not the only cause of global warming. It is exacerbated by other greenhouse gases, such as methane from farm animals and natural gas processing, not to mention nitrous oxide from fertilizers. And when you add this to the fact that we've been eliminating natural carbon absorbing sinks like forests for the past 100 years, the effects become even more pronounced. In the last 100 years, about 20% of the world's forests have been lost. So if humans are really to blame, what can we do about this? Each of us can help by reducing our individual carbon footprint and encouraging others to do the same. We only have one lifeboat. There is no spare. What's more harmful than denial is apathy. Climate change is not likely to wipe out the human race. What we are really working towards is trying to reduce human suffering. Because these changes will cause more and more havoc. Life will get even more difficult. The Earth will survive. It is a passive canvas. It does not give a damn what or who survives or who suffers. To paraphrase Carl Sagan, no cavalry is coming to help. There's nothing that will save us from ourselves except for our collective determination. And if you want to do something about this starting today, you can start by getting more informed. In fact, I was prompted to make this video after seeing an exceptionally informative series on Wondrium, today's sponsor, called Solving for Zero, The Search for Climate Innovation. This 10-part educational program not only tells you about the state of the planet today, but outlines how new innovations could lower our net carbon emissions to zero in just 30 years. 
It's within our power to change these things. This is a special series sponsored by Wondrium in recognition of this month, which is Earth Month, emphasizing sustainability for planet Earth. You'll find not only this, but many other programs in Wondrium taught by some of the best educators in the world. What I really love about the courses on Wondrium is that they don't cover any subject superficially. They are in depth, covering the details and many different aspects of a given subject. That's why I've been a member for Wondrium for a long time. I can't recommend them enough. You'll even see my testimonial at the bottom of Wondrium's homepage. It's really easy to sign up right now because they are offering a free trial and you can cancel at any time. So you have nothing to lose and a whole lot to gain. So be sure to click the special link in the description to take advantage of this free offer. The link is wondrium.com slash Arvin. That's wondrium.com slash Arvin. And you'll be supporting this channel when you do. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart for that. And if you enjoy content like this and want more, then be sure to hit the subscribe button so you can be informed the minute you post a new video. And if you have any questions for me, please leave them in the comment section. I try to answer all interesting questions. I'll see you in the next video, my friend.